Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the uh, 4X My Wellbeing uh, <laughs> webinar here on the cost of influence. Um, we are going to be talking about creator mental health. Um, as always, we'll give people a minute or two to roll in here. Um, and you can let us know in the chat, maybe where you're, where you're joining from. Um, but, uh, but thank you all for, uh, for joining here today. Austin, Phoenix. We got a Boston. Okay, hello Boston, hello Toronto. Mexico City, jealous. My last visit to Mexico City wasn't amazing. I spent it uh, very sick in my hotel room the entire time, unfortunately. Yes. It's a bad octopus, I think, but uh, did not, it did not change my feelings on Mexico City, which I, <laughs> or I, octopus. I, I still it. love. Octopus, it's changed my feelings on. I, have, <laughs> I, have, I can't, I can't do it. Uh, maybe I need to give it another six months or so. Mm. Um, Okay, welcome again to everyone. Still have some people rolling in here. Um, fantastic. Well, we have a little presentation and some really great panelists who are joining us today. So we are gonna get started and we'll let people join as they roll in. Um, before we get going, I, I just wanna say this is obviously a pretty heavy day given the news in the last 24 hours. It's um, something we're going to discuss with the panelists. Um, I am generally horrified, and 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 uh, you know it's been kind of difficult twelve hours just um, dealing with the fact that this continues to happen again and again. We're going to try and keep you know keep the tone upbeat, um, but I did want to just acknowledge um, what is is going on in the world, and again, it's something that we will discuss. Um, we're going to try to have as much fun with this as we can, um, but, uh, but just wanted to, to say that first and to kind of, we thought it would be a good idea um, as we kind of enter this and we, we talk about mental health and uh, kind of the cost of being online all the time to have Alyssa, who is the CEO and co-founder of My Wellbeing. Uh, lead us in a breathing exercise to just kind of center us all, make sure we're all really present. Melissa, I will, I'll kick it to you. Thanks, James. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning that. I think this exercise can be really helpful anytime you're feeling overwhelmed. I think today it is especially relevant. And I appreciate you sharing Trisha and chat and being vulnerable and authentic about your experience. So the breathing exercise um, is a box breathing exercise, and it's something that um, you can hold in your back pocket whenever you need it. If something comes up on your feed, if a comment comes in that is alarming or disturbing for you, if you make a mistake, if you have something coming up that is intimidating or is new. So Generally, with any breathing exercise, I recommend that you try to do it for three plus minutes. There's a little bit of science that shows that's about the length of time at which you can really meaningfully de-escalate some of your neuro, just some of the, the stress reactions, some of the triggers, some of the activation you might be feeling. Today, we'll do an intro and it's called box breathing for a reason. It is shaped like a box. So if you think about, you'd be inhaling for four seconds, hold for four seconds at the top, exhaling for four seconds, and holding for four seconds. So we'll practice that a little bit. I'll guide us to do a couple rounds. It is intentionally very simple. It's meant to be something you can remember, you can lean on you can do with relatively limited time, relatively little quote unquote sophistication, but you may be surprised by how powerful it can be. So if you start to feel some of that overwhelm, some of that stress kick up, this is a great tool to have in your back pocket. So we'll do it for about just a couple, maybe a minute now to be mindful of our time together today. If you wanna just feel a little grounded, a little centered, you can put your feet flat on the floor, you can uncross your legs or uncross your arms. 
unclench anything that might be clenched, whether it's your temples or your jaw or your stomach. And I invite you to inhale for three, two, one. Hold, three, two, one. Exhale, three, two, one. Hold, three, two, one. Inhale, three, two, one. Hold, three, two, one. Exhale, three, two, one. And hold for three, two, one. So usually the exercise, I do recommend four seconds. I was counting down by three because of mentioning the words themselves. I really hope this can be a tool that brings you a little bit of relief. And throughout our time together today, we'll talk through some additional tools. You'll gain a lot of knowledge, but also a lot of concrete things you can walk away with to help manage some of those stress levels. I'll turn it back to you, James. Thanks, Alyssa. I felt like I was I was doing my Headspace sleep cast there. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so why are we here? Right. This uh, is something I actually really started thinking about um, when I saw a post from Jess Kirby, who's going to be on the panel um, later in the presentation, and she was talking about potentially leaving Instagram for good and. It, it kind of got me uh, paying more attention to this. And I just noticed more and more influencers kind of talking about the toll of being an influencer, being online, the toll that's taking on their mental health. And I think what we want to do here is, you know, create a space to talk about this. Um, we want to share some survey results. So we surveyed hundreds of influencers. Um, so we're going to share some of those results. Um, and I, I think that, you know, ideally make you, Feel like one that that you're not alone in this you know that this is um this is a real problem um and it's something that is worth talking about i think it's it can be hard as uh, as an influencer to you know talk about some of the struggles because um in so many ways you know your life is probably quite privileged um and you can feel like those feelings aren't valid um and you know here again, a place to, to say that they are valid um, and then give you some tools to hopefully deal with it. Um, and again, you know, you're not alone. Um, and again, those feelings are valid. This issue is pervasive. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's not been studied as much as it should be or will be. You know, what is the cost of having your entire life, you know, there for the internet uh, for decades? Um, what is the cost of, you know, having to constantly be entertaining and educating people? Um, what is the cost of having hundreds of thousands of people all feel like they, you know, have uh, ownership of or a piece of you, right? That there is a, you have a, a relationship with them. How do you maintain a relationship with hundreds of thousands or, or millions of people or tens of thousands, whatever it is? But I don't think these issues have been researched nearly enough. I think they will be in the coming years, but I think it is, is a much more pervasive and, and much more, uh, I think, problematic issue than, than is being discussed. Um, so we asked influencers first, how often are you feeling anxiety? Um, and as you can see here, quite common, um, you might look at the number and say, oh, 39%, 24%. But if you look at that, that is 64% uh, um, of survey respondents are feeling anxiety at least a week, um, at least weekly. And, and I know, Lissa, um, you know, anxiety is a, is a big driver of the, of the people that, that come to my well-being. Um, and I know you were pretty surprised by some of these numbers, right? Um, and, and felt like this was... was uh, pretty high numbers, um, certainly. Um, so another question, do you feel your use of social media is a key factor 
in raising your anxiety levels, right? Is because there's just living in America these days, there is a certain level of anxiety that that we can expect. Do you think social media is a key factor? 76% said yes. Uh, that that one again completely floored me. Um, 67% of survey respondents consider quitting social altogether at least once a month. Um, I, again, I, I would hope that my employees, that 67% of them wouldn't say that they consider quitting once a month. I think that number is really, really high. I was very surprised to see that. Um, so what is impacting mental health? We asked, you know, what is, what is causing these things? Um, you know, creative burnout, the algorithm, of course, comparison syndrome, financial insecurity, brand partnerships. We're gonna dive into all of these with the panelists, um, but you can see here, especially these kind of top four are, are pretty equal drivers in what is causing, uh, causing this anxiety and causing people to feel this way. Creative burnout, you know, we're gonna talk much more deeply about this in the panel. Um, this is probably one of the most difficult ones. Again, it's the highest, uh, it's the thing people feel the most. I think that there is, you know, a very real cost to what y'all do. Um, I, I think that it gets, um, you know, it gets, it, it's something that the general population um, doesn't think is a real thing, right? That like the fact that you have to post all day and you have to, um, you know, kind of constantly be on is not a valid reason to feel burnout. But as somebody that started as a content creator many, many years ago, um, I absolutely know it is, it's exhausting. Um, and I think there's also a real cost to taking, you know, the things that you love, right? As an influencer, you want to share a lot of those, um, you know, the things that are your passions, the things that bring you joy. And by sharing those and then by building a following community off of it, that becomes your job. And, you know, it, it can be really dangerous to, to mix those things. And what happens when, you know, the things that you used to just be able to enjoy, you now have to figure out how to uh, cover for social media and they become a job and they become sponsored and all that. And, 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 you know, how do we recapture that passion that we had when we started? when we weren't making money on this maybe, right? When we just started this because, um, you know, we wanted to share our love for fashion or beauty or whatever it might be. I mean, I know Jess, we'll talk about this later, but Jess was part of one of our first sponsored uh, campaigns ever. And that was almost, you know, I think that was eight years ago and she had already been doing it for, you know, at least half a decade. So how do you, how do you keep doing this for decades um, and keep that passion? Um, Industry and algorithm turbulence. Um, I, you know, it is hard to build your business on something that you don't control. We're going to talk about control later. We're going to talk about how do you manage, um, you know, how do you manage your feelings towards those things that you can't control. But those things have a very real impact on your life. You know, the the Instagram algorithm, these platforms, it's it's probably similar to like as a business owner, I would think about the stock market or the economy, right? That like. I don't have control over the stock market, but the stock market has a huge amount of control over my business and my life. And so it's not enough to just say, well, don't worry about it. You know, you can't control it. So just don't worry about it. Well, you do worry about it because again, it's, it's your income, it's your life. You have no control over that. And that is a really scary thing that that can definitely cause a lot of anxiety. Um, this is another question. You know, do you avoid taking breaks for fear that your performance will be impacted? 75% said yes. Right? So in those moments where we feel tired, where we feel like we can't do it, where we don't feel up to posting, we feel afraid to stop because we think the algorithm is going to discount our posts, right? That like we need to be posting consistently to stay on top. Um, that's really, that's really hard. You know, I just took uh, a, a week long trip with my fiance and I was lucky enough to not have to do any work. You know, that would be hard to almost impossible for an influencer to do. So I think this is a really unique problem. 65% um, talked about comparison syndrome and that being something that's really difficult. Again, you've got, you know, you've essentially got, you know, this very public marker of, of success, right? Um, and a way to compare yourself against other people in a way that almost no other job does, right? I, you know, you don't, 
people don't walk around with like their bank account, you know, floating above their head, but y'all have that. You can see everyone else's wins. You know, everyone who gets the campaign that you wanted are working with the brand that you dream of, whose following grew 10,000, um, you know, 10,000 uh, followers in the last month when yours hasn't grown um, really hard. Financial insecurity and freelance pressure. Um, this is just, you know, uh, you know, you don't have a salary. You don't have, you know, you don't have 401k. You don't have insurance. You have to do all this on your own. Um, and some of that coming, you know, from brands and you, you, you feel, you know, you don't feel valued by brands. Um, you know, it's something we talk about, like uh, we see this a lot with influencers who are getting low offers and feel like a brand is insulting them. Like, and we always say that like the brand's offer is not a calculation of your, or a reflection of your worth. Um, some brands don't know what they're doing. Um, we talked a lot about that in the pricing uh, webinar that uh, we did last month and we can, we can share the video, but um, that's a very real concern. Uh, and 24% said audience relationship. I was, I was surprised and happy to see that this was, uh, this was so low, um, that, you know, your communities are still generally a place that, uh, you are getting energy from that aren't taking energy, but inside of, of the community, you know, things that, that y'all were concerned about was negative comments. One, uh, again, easy to say, ignore them much harder to do. Uh, I can, I can remember a lot, you know, insults people have said that, you know, 10 years later, I still think about. Um, so that is really hard if, uh, if you get those negative comments consistently. Um, again, that feeling of always having to be on um, and wanting empathy from your audience um, to take breaks. Uh, I sometimes see influencers post and say, so sorry, you know, so sorry I haven't posted in a couple of days. Um, and it's like a weekend. And that, again, that, that's such a unique thing. Like my employees don't come in on Monday and say, oh, I'm so, so sorry I didn't work this weekend. Uh, you know, but you have to apologize for taking a couple hours, a couple of days off. Um, and then the pressure to um, talk about current events. You know, so many influencers got into this um, to talk about beauty, to talk about fashion. Uh, we believe that having a following means that, you know, you should be using it to, to push forward the causes that matter and that you should be using your following for good. But that's not why you started it. And, and it's a lot to deal with. Um, and people are looking to influencers and, and, and that's hard. Um, I, I wanted Alyssa to, to maybe um, share some, uh, before we get into the panel and talk more about this, Alyssa, do you have anything that uh, specifically on this kind of negative comments or online bullying of ways that, actionable ways that we could try and, and handle that and deal with it? Definitely. So I think with a lot of things, one of the most important things is to name how challenging and how hurtful it is and to give yourself permission to be hurt by it. You know, I think especially influencers are under a lot of pressure to be perfect, be carefree, be confident all the time. You're supposed to take these comments in stride and they're really hurtful. So I think allowing some of that hurt and some of that space being, having some grace with yourself is really big. I also think something, sometimes you can fall into a spiral or a rabbit hole of overthinking, getting really fixated. So it's worth noting, you know, biologically, psychologically, our minds orient more toward the negative than the positive. The reason for that is generally it's a survival tactic where we're scanning for threats. We're looking for, we're wanting to maximize our survival. So we're scanning for what could possibly go wrong. It's true in comments and online bullying. It's true walking down the street, you know, you might be more likely to notice a puddle or a hole in the, in the pavement than the sunshine or the flowers. Um, and what I think can help counter that is by having something you can reference that includes some of the praise or positive comments or ways that you've really changed so many lives. So keeping something relatively accessible, whether it's on your notes app in your phone, whether it's on a Google doc, whether it's on a poster in your living room or hanging on your fridge of, I have no doubt that each and every one of you here has positively impacted lives. And sometimes when we are in the midst of 
someone saying something really horrible or really hurtful, it, we can lose sight of that. All of a sudden that goes out the wind and we're like, oh my God, we are the absolute worst. How could I, how, why am I doing this? I'm not qualified. I, I can't, you know, and I think being able to use that tool a little bit to come back to center, to say, you know what, I am human and I make mistakes, or this person is being unright, unkind for no particular reason. Maybe you didn't make a mistake at all. And um, to have those reminders for yourself. And I also think it's really helpful to have a couple one-liner templates for how you can respond. So if you are someone who responds to every comment, you might not be, and that is totally fine. It depends on your strategy. It depends on how you go about your platform. If you are someone who responds to every comment, having some templates that can help take some of the emotional strain off of every single one of these being a brand new conversation and having some templates that you can say, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Thanks for coming to my page. You know, I hope you find something helpful. Otherwise, I, I wish you the best. And if, you know, it's not going to be hyper personalized to what they're saying necessarily, but maybe they're being unrightly really mean. And maybe that is a little bit of a boundary, a little bit of a barrier you can introduce for yourself that if you just have a couple of those that you can copy paste, that might reduce, maybe it takes you a couple minutes to respond to one of those comments instead of a couple hours or even 30 minutes, you know, and really thinking about it and, and thinking about it and stewing on it. And then finally, I would say, you know, James, to your point about these things can sit with us. I think it's really important to have outlets for how you can let go. So whether that be a supportive community like four, whether that be a small group of fans, cheerleaders, friends, fellow influencers, close family or friends or a romantic partner that you can um, find some relief, find some catharsis to try to let go of some of the pain, some of the hurt. I also think um, I'm biased as a therapist and as someone who helps people find therapists, it can be working with a therapist, it can be working with a coach, it can be working with a mentor, maybe someone who's been doing this another five years or is you know, a couple steps ahead of where you want to be. So if they look back on something that you're going through right prime time in that moment, for them, they may have troubleshot 12 different things and three of them didn't work, seven of them were okay, you know, and they might be able to help you accelerate a little bit of the mm -hmm. things that you might want to try, particularly if you see yourself in them. If they are very different than you, um, you know, if they say, I'm going to go lift weights and that is like not your scene, then take away the grain of salt, obviously. But if you see yourself in them and they, they say, you know, I go painting twice a month because it is just so it's off screen. It is, it's with my hands. I get dirty. I get, you know, totally distraught, you know, out of sight, out of mind from the internet. Um, maybe that's something that resonates with you and maybe it's something you wouldn't have necessarily thought of on your own, but having these point people that you can lean on and it comes full circle to what James was saying in the beginning of, um, you're not in this alone and really trying to remember and really trying to surround yourself with a support system that even when things get really messy, they show up. And I know even for me on days when I'm outside of my capacity, I have to figure out how to do something that I've never done before and have no reason to know how to do. I'll talk with a mentor. Maybe I'm crying. Maybe I'm freaking out. And they're very level-headed. They've been there before. And they say, you know, I'm so proud of you for being so honest and authentic about this. I can see how much you care about this. Let's make a plan. Like, let's see what are our options. Let's break this down and breaking down something big and messy into something concrete. Yeah. So I know there's a lot of things, but that's pause great. there. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And, and I think lots of actionable stuff there and we'll continue discussing with the panel. And I'm going to zoom through here because I want to get to our wonderful panelists as, as quickly as possible. Um, and something we've talked about before is, is just this idea of influencers establishing house rules. Um, this could be something that helps helps you with your audience to just, you know, set rules on what to expect from, you know, do you respond to DMs or not? Um, you know, do you respond to comments like political commentary, privacy? Do you take days off? whatever it might be, I think it can be helpful to just state those things. So, you know, your audience is your audience and you can help kind of educate them on how you want to interact with them. Um, and lastly, before we jump into the panel, something I've been thinking about, you know, at four, I spend a lot of my time thinking about 
making sure our employees are happy, satisfied, uh, and want to work there. And, and it's, you know, increasingly as the organization grows, it has become, um, you know, one of the main focuses of the entire executive team. And I look at, you know, what are the things that drive job dissatisfaction? It's often you don't like your boss, you don't like your colleagues, you don't like the work that you're doing, your growth is stagnant, you don't believe in the work you're doing, you're overworked and underpaid and underappreciated. And as I looked at these and, and was thinking about it in relationship to influencers, you know, so much of this, you don't have a support system to help. You know, if an employee feels like it's too much work that you're asking me to do, they can go to their boss and, and you know, we might be able to hire somebody to help them or move that work off of their plate. If they feel underpaid, they can ask for a raise. Um, you know, if they don't like the work they're doing, they can go work at another company, take their skills somewhere else. But as an influencer, you don't have that. And I think, you know, it's something that as you look at each of these, unfortunately, you're, you're generally responsible for all of them. If you're feeling like your growth is stagnant, you have to create a growth, right? If you think you should be making more money, you have to figure out how to make more money. And it's really, really hard. And I think that this is another thing that's not really talked about much. And, and I could go on for it in a while. I think I'll talk about it in the Gronies with Nord here in the, in the coming weeks because I want to get to the panelists. But we're going to share this deck. And I think I encourage you all to look at this and, and think about, you know, what in the work that you do, um, how does this relate to maybe some of the feelings of dissatisfaction you're feeling? And what could you do to help counterbalance that? How could you create that, you know, uh, again, like if we look at colleagues, one of the things I think the people work at for love is who they work with, right? And so influencers, you don't have that. How can you, how can you get that? You know, how can you make your brand partners feel more like colleagues? How can you build a group of influencers who you collaborate with? Stuff like that. But I want to get on to the meat of this and the really interesting part of this presentation, uh, which is talking to our panelists. So we can turn the uh, cameras on here. Um, hello, hello. So we've got Jess Kirby, who I've talked about before. Jess is OG4. She's been here from the beginning. Uh, again, we've been working with her for like eight years now, um, which is uh, fantastic. Alyssa, who you obviously know, CEO of My Wellbeing. Emma DeMar is a uh, influencer and therapist um, and uh, is going to be, I think, has a really interesting insight there. And Danye is a head of creator initiatives here at Four, and also an influencer. So welcome everybody, hello. Um, as I mentioned, I think we should start by talking about um, what it's like to be a, um, you know, a public figure, especially during the last few years. Um, when it has just seemed like there are so many things going on in the world that as an influencer, you're expected to comment on. Um, and maybe even harder, you're expected to work through, you know? Um, and I know we try and pause, like right now, all of our sponsored posts are paused. We will not be doing any sponsored content uh, today. And, and, you know, we'll see when we lift that freeze, but that's not everybody. Not every brand is, is, is uh, forgiving that way. Jess, I know you are someone that is very vocal about um, your political beliefs. Um, it's something I think you have really encouraged other influencers to do more of, and you are really a, a, a bit of a trailblazer in that. But, but how, how, how much of a strain is that put um, on you having to, to always be commenting on these things and, and to be a, a fashion influencer during um, these times of distress? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think it is so, so important, um, particularly as a person with influence to use that. Um, and, and I think a lot of people in my community have sort of come to rely on me to like, when something happens, it's like they're coming to me, like, what should I do? How, you know? And so my response to that is sort of, um, become multi-pronged in the sense that, yes, I'll always um, post about what's going on and my response to it and what we can do, but also like give me some time to process what just happened. And I think, um, 
you were talking about it earlier about the fact that like naturally we're sort of inclined to like go towards the negative. Um, and I think that happens so often on social media when something bad happens, we all get sucked into our phone and we're just doom scrolling and looking for more updates instead of taking a minute, getting offline, sitting with what just happened, processing it, and then going and saying, okay, you know, here's how I'm processing this. Here's what I think we can do next. And that's so important for everyone to do, not just influencers, but anyone who's consuming content online and social media. And I think when you as an influencer do that and say, I need time to process this, it also gives the people in your community time to process it too. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Do you get, um, do you, you know, as someone that talks about, um, you know, talks about this a lot, do you ever get the comments that are like, well, what about this other thing? You know, there's so much, so much terrible stuff happening in the world. Yeah. Um, you can't cover all of it. You, you can't be yeah. deeply invested in all of it. Like, and I've right. seen certain influencers, I think, who, who, who have specific issues they're really passionate about sharing messages of like, well, why aren't you talking about this other thing, you know, that's happening? Um, is mm -hmm. that something you, you, you've experienced? And, and do you yeah. have advice on how to handle it? Yeah, I mean, I think most influencers at this point have probably gotten some sort of, you know, well, what about X, Y, Z? Um, and I, I mean, I think that the best response is I'm not the news, right? I'm not a journalist. And I, I think that people get angry with that response because for some people it's a cop out to say, I'm not the news. Like I'm just throwing up my hands and I'm not going to say anything about anything because like positivity and light and no, that's not what we're saying. Um, but I think we all have permission to choose um, how we want to use our platforms and the issues that we want to talk about. And I think it's just, it's unrealistic. And, and I think you have permission as an influencer to say this, it's unrealistic to expect me to talk about every single issue going on in the world. Um, and, and nor do I think most people really want to see that, but everybody has mm -hmm. their thing that they want to see someone mm -hmm. talking about. And I've also just gone ahead and said, hey, here's a couple of journalists I follow that I, I really appreciate their take on current events and the news. And this is who I follow to stay informed. But don't come to me expecting that because that's that's not what I do. Mm, yeah, that's yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Donye, as a black woman, uh, I think this has been especially um, real for black creators in the last few years. Um, uh, you know, what is your, what is your take on how you kind of balance, um, you know, balance the very real issues and, and talking about and supporting those things um, with um, the lighthearted for you, the marketing content, the other things that you're doing? Um, I kind of look at myself as like a, like a traffic director, you know, like, in the middle of New York, it's really busy. You know, there's a lot of cars and the traffic director at any moment, based on the amount of traffic, they can put their hand up and say, you know what, stop everything coming this way. I'm going to stop. These people can pass and things like that. So that's how I look at myself and my social media. When it's traffic that's coming my way, I feel like, you know, things that are a little bit more specific or that hit a little bit harder for me. Um, I do share, but, you know, like to uh, Justice's point, I'm not a political person. So I try my best to follow people that, you know, speak on different ways. I mean, speak on different topics in a way that I can. So even today I reposted a story from my friend Rashad who, you know, chimes in on these things. You know, like I chime in, like you said, on like marketing things, lifestyle influencer things, but Rashad, this is kind of like his moment or how he utilizes social media to express himself. So I make sure that I follow people that are interested in different worldly views, like not just politics, but just things in general. So I'm able to kind of like, you know, redirect my traffic to his page. It's like, okay, if you are interested or you're looking for information surrounding this topic, here's a resource that you can go to. And I think doing that kind of helps me feel like I'm doing my part too, because it's like, I'm still providing value to my audience, but it kind of takes the pressure off of me 
to make sure that it's coming from me. So that's kind of how I deal with it um, when different yeah. tragic events happen in the world. Yeah. Um, Emma, I, uh, hello, welcome. Hello. Um, so as Jess was saying, uh, you know, Jess, I like how you're talking about like, you know, telling your audience, look, I need a minute to process this, right? Uh, the stat, I think, as I went through the survey results, something that really jumped out at me was that, you know, just the level, you know, 65% of people feeling anxiety at least once a week and 75% of people saying that social media was the key factor in raising their anxiety levels. Um, again, you are a therapist, you have a like therapy specific in Instagram page, and then you have more of a, a kind of lifestyle uh, page where you're an influencer yourself. So I think you're, you're really like, I'm sure it's something that you have thought about. So how do we, you know, how do we handle, you know, when the thing that is causing us anxiety is the thing that is also making us money? Um, what, what, how do we balance that? How do we deal with it? Yeah, I think it's all about how you conceptualize your page and going back to your purpose really in having a social media presence. So the reason that I actually do have a personal account and a therapy focused account is because of that very reason that I view those two purposes very separate. One is for my career as a therapist and mental health and all of that. And the other is my other interests, fashion, travel, whatever that might be. So I'm able to have that differentiation because they're on separate pages. It's harder to do that when everything is combined. And therefore, I think it's really important to remind yourself of what do you want to keep online and what's going to be a part of your platform and what isn't. Um, and there is, of course, that pressure to always share more and always have your page be about things that are not the reason why you started the page to begin with. And I think it's also in that really important to remember that at times like these, people just want answers and guidance and they don't realize always or take into account that just because you have a platform doesn't mean that you are an expert on X, Y, and Z. And so reminding yourself of the humanity, I think, in that and the fact that people are just looking for some sort of sense of guidance or authority. And that does not mean that you have to provide that as tough as that might be, um, having your boundaries with that as well. So all about the boundaries and how you conceptualize your page and what your purpose is on the platform and what it's not. Yeah. Um, something I think everyone in, in, the, in the chat and listening is probably thought about is uh, the algorithm. Okay, uh, this is a different, <laughs> it's, it feels like a different place than it was um, even five years ago, certainly just uh, from, you know, when, when you and I were getting started on this in whatever, 2006, 2007. Um, I, th I think, you know, there is a lot of frustration from the influencer community that, you know, these platforms are changing, the algorithms are changing, and they can't control it. Um, and, you know, something they've spent years building is not working as well as it was a month ago, six months ago, a year ago. Um, Jess, I guess first, just, I know it's something you've talked about um, and, and I know you've actually thought about leaving Instagram for a number of reasons. I know that's maybe one of them um, and, and focusing more on a platform you control, which is a blog, um, but would love to hear you know, your thoughts on that um, and, um, uh, and then, you know, maybe Alyssa, we can jump to kind of what we can do when, when we have these things in our lives that we don't control, but, but do have a big, uh, impact on our lives. So Jess, if you want to start. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough because, um, Instagram was just the way for so long. And it was like, that was what you focused on and what you put a lot of your time and effort into and that's where brands want to work with you still to this day a lot of the campaigns I get are all on Instagram um and so I mean I do think it's so 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 important and I've said this 
since the day I started monetizing my content that you should absolutely diversify your platforms. Um, work as hard as you can to move your community to a newsletter list, to a blog, to a Patreon, or to another online community that isn't so reliant in one place. Um, and then, uh, you know, I also think, you know, you talked earlier about how it's like, it's easy to say, well, you know, like the algorithm is what it is. Like there's nothing you can do about it. And, and that might be true. There is not much you can do about it. <laughs> um, and that's why one, it's so important to diversify. And two, it's so important to take breaks because, um, Instagram will always be there. Your community will always be there. Um, it may seem like if you take a break, everything will be gone, but I've done it and everything is still there <laughs> and nothing will change. <laughs> Did you feel um, like when you came and, back from those yeah. breaks, like, cause I remember when you took I think, a couple of week break before, um, yeah. and again, it's, it's something even in the survey, a lot of people want, said they want to do, but they're afraid to do. Um, yeah. And look, we can't, we can't know fully in the algorithm. I did ask Facebook about this. They, they, they didn't get, you know, they weren't going to comment on it, but, um, but I, what, I would love to hear what, how you felt like coming back from that two weeks, you know, coming back from those breaks, do you feel like uh, a bit more refreshed? Do you feel like you've kind of, you regained some of, 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 you know, the, the, whatever you had lost in return mm -hmm. in regards to social. Oh, I felt, I felt amazing. I felt like I didn't want to come back, honestly, um, because I felt so good not being on Instagram. And that's really what prompted me to write the post that you're, you talked about that I wrote and also what prompted me. So I actually am leaving Instagram at the end of the year. I'm going to have someone run my Instagram for me. Um, because essentially the way I look at it now is Instagram is a marketing tool. Um, and I think there's better ways to connect with my audience that aren't on Instagram because I, I'm feeling so much less control over how my content is seen on that platform. Um, and for a whole host of other reasons that I, I won't get into here, but um, I think taking breaks is so, so important. And I think the interesting thing that I learned when I did it, because I did it over the holidays and I actually encouraged my community to do it with me just as an experiment and people were blown away one by how hard it was to take a break but two by how good they felt when they took the break mm. and i think it's so hard to pull away from something when we feel like we're going to be missing out and something that we probably use every day many many times a day but when you do take that break and it, it needs to be a solid break. I, I don't think a weekend is long enough. I, I didn't even feel like two weeks was long enough. I'm actually taking a month off in July. So we'll see how that goes. I'll keep you posted. Um, but I think the overwhelming response from everyone I know that took a break when I did was, wow, I, I, I feel so good um, and I feel so refreshed. And from a creative perspective, I felt so like renewed um, mm -hmm. from just taking a step back and I imagine like stating that and being like I'm taking two weeks off and even encouraging your audience to join you probably lose some of the guilt right because I think sometimes people will be like you know what I'm going to take today off like I need a break um but then the whole day they're feeling guilty like oh sh should I be should I be posting something like you know um so I think being able to state that and, and take that um break publicly probably is really helpful um Alyssa I want to talk about control but as Jess was talking um, a question for you. Do you think that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, um, we're going to look back and say, wow, we were like hopelessly addicted to these platforms and didn't know how destructive, you know, being rolling over, you know, waking up in bed, grabbing your phone and opening social is, um, do you think that this is like a real addiction that, that the future will look back and, and like we, you know, uh, look back on people smoking in the 50s? I personally do. I also don't think it's that far away. I don't know if any of you saw Social Dilemma. Um, and, you know, you have the leaders at every social media platform saying that they essentially don't allow their children to use it. 
And it's like, okay, so if you've the folks who are behind the curtain, who are pulling the levers, who are designing the algorithms, who are doing the marketing and the, and the revenue plans and et cetera, saying, from what I've seen, I'd rather not have my kin using it, despite the social pressures of what I think is a really hard um, position for young people. And when I say young people, absolutely people in our age group who are here, but I'm also talking about like single digit elementary school, middle school, high school, um, is that there is so much social pressure at that age to be doing what your friends are doing, to be included, to be popular, to know what the, what the trends are. And there isn't yet a, physically a developmental stage necessarily, you know, people of different maturity levels, but to know what these high level consequences are or, or to know or trust why your parents might not want you to, or to know or trust like, wow, what's nature? Like, I don't care. My friend's using Instagram or my friend's using TikTok. So um, I think there's a lot of research and conversation actively being done about like how catastrophic the consequences are. And what I think the biggest shame is, is that I think similar to what you're saying, Jess, and pieces, and what you're all saying in pieces, is I think, I really do believe that fundamentally these tools were created for connection. And I do also think that in a world where things like COVID are, are, you know, there's roller coasters of how pervasive it is and how isolating it is. I do think there's a world where we can and should be using technology toward connection and toward community building, um, but that there needs to be balance. And that when anything is out of balance, so to your point, James, you roll over in the middle of the night, you're, you're opening up, there, there's an absolutely an addictive nature and social dilemma, dilemma goes into it. It's designed that way. It's designed to be addictive, to increase engagement, to increase volume of users, to further monetize. And from a business perspective, I think we could all imagine, even if we don't agree with the why behind of like how, how it evolved in that way. Um, so what, I, what I'm most curious about in the future is I think sometimes, especially when there are as massive rates of burnout as there are, as massive rates of anxiety as, they are, as there are, sometimes I think when you're at a low or even when you're approaching the low, you really need a break and sometimes cold turkey's the way. Like Joss is saying, like two weeks a month, like you got to separate, you got to reconnect with what your purpose is, what brings you joy above and beyond this. But I'm also really curious, is it an all or nothing situation? You know, does social media or virtual connection or virtual influence need to end? I don't, I like to think it doesn't. Like I like to think, you know, it also brings, you know, I picture someone who maybe lives in a really small town who maybe ordinarily wouldn't connect with someone who they feel camaraderie with or feel connection with. Maybe they feel a little weird or they have a weird quirk or that, you know, and through technology and through social media or through, you know, Reddit, like they find really deep friendships. And um, so anyway, I know, I think, I think the consequences of social media comparison anxiety, the constant pressure to be on are catastrophic. And I think we need mm -hmm. regulation on, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, speaking to what we all are saying, I don't, know that I am the person with the specific expertise to know what that literal regulation is. I am concerned about the consequences and I'm curious about what does balance look like and how can you maintain and embrace the highs that come from being able to connect with a broader community, being able to connect with a more diverse community than, than the community you're immediately surrounded by geographically mm -hmm. without you know, the constant onslaught or on stream of triggering information, body dysmorphia, comparison anxiety, performance anxiety. So um, I think it's very real. And I think we see that definitely in certain research studies that are being released, but also just in rates of mental illness in younger and younger generations and a direct correlation of steep increases the younger you look. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's not exclusively social media, but it is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. Tanya, I, I, I like you using the hand raising uh, feature there. You know, um, I wanted to just say something really quick. 
and there's like a new thought that I had, but it's really weird how everybody is different. Everybody has different personalities, different ways that they deal with stuff, but social media kind of forces everybody to like funnel through this one funnel. Like I can be completely different from Alyssa or Emma or Jess or even you, but on social media, we're all kind of expected to have the same measures of success. And I just don't think that that's fair. And I think that people should start trying to look at social media as a way that like matches their personality. Like if you're a type A person, it's like, what does that look like on social media? If you're not type A, how does that look like on social media? So I think how people have like their own blood types like people should have like social media types like maybe you're not the type to post every single day maybe you are somebody that takes frequent breaks like Jess and I think the more that influencers are transparent with the way that they utilize social media I think it makes it easier for other creators to say hey like I connect with her because she's like me but if everybody's doing the same thing then there's no way to differentiate so um I just yeah. wanted to get that. That's a great point. That's a great point. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I want to start getting to questions. Um, and one of them is for Emma. Um, and it's a topic, again, that I think a lot of influencers are thinking about. You know, what can we do to um, take care of ourselves? I mean, we already talked about breaks. So outside of taking breaks, you know, what can we do to avoid burnout? Um, but also making sure we're taking care of ourselves financially, right? That understanding that there is, um, that, you know, we have to balance that. Um, what are some tips there? I think that one thing to do is really think about yourself, your inner child, if you will, and think about what you perhaps love to do before social media either existed, or if you grew up with social media, besides social media, what do you enjoy doing with your time? and actually scheduling that in to your calendar and to your life and making those things a priority. So that does tie into taking breaks. And sometimes you need the break to figure that out because you can't do it with all the noise of social media. So we have to kind of tune out all of that in order to tune in and figure out what is it that we actually like to do. And I think a lot of the problem is we don't know anymore because we are just automatically turning to our phones for all the distraction between work. So really taking the time away to think about individually for yourself, what is it that makes you excited and energized again and filling up your time with those things. And perhaps you can also find something that will be profitable in those things, speaking to the financial aspect, if, if you don't want to rely just on the social media component, because of course, you know, there are the ups and downs, the fluctuations, maybe there's something else in something that you're actually passionate about that you can find to monetize as well. Mm -hmm. And I know you talked, Emma, about how, you know, you kind of keep your two separate, your pages separate. Um, and something I think that I've been thinking about with burnout is just, you know, um, as your life changes again, that, that, that pressure to kind of share everything, just, you know, you are a relatively new mother, um, and that's a big change in your life and content. How have you balanced that big life change and your audience's desire to, to probably get your advice around what you're, how you're raising your kid, the products you're using, all that? You know, how have you balanced that with um, you know, maybe not wanting to share uh, so much of that and, and keeping that to yourself? Yeah, I think this is such a great point, James, because I, I know for me personally, um, one of the biggest sources of anxiety from this job is sharing some of the personal aspects of my life. Um, and I'm actually like pretty open with my, um, with my community and I have been for a very long time, but becoming a mother, just like I did a 180. Um, and I decided last summer that I wasn't going to share images of my daughter online for a whole host of reasons. And that was actually one of the best things I ever did for my mental health um, because it just removed so much stress and anxiety of putting her image out there, um, which I think is just like 
I won't get into all of my strong opinions on putting kids online, but let's just say I'm not comfortable with it. Um, but I think I have found a healthy balance of how to still talk about my journey and motherhood um, and having a toddler in a way that respects her privacy, but also allows me to connect with my audience because um, they are so interested in that because I have a lot to say on that. Um, and because it is a way for me to connect with my community. So I think particularly with um, personal aspects of your life, and it's the same thing for my, my partner is not um, a public person. He doesn't want, really want to be on social media. And so that's, I just don't post him and that's okay because that he didn't sign up for this. I did. And so I think it's so important um, that you have clear boundaries in your family and your life with what you want to share, what you feel comfortable with sharing. Um, and your audience will respect that. And I have to say my community has been so, so respectful and receptive of, of how I've decided to share my life online. Um, and I still get to have like so many meaningful conversations around motherhood and having a kid, um, but in a way that feels good to me. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I've noticed other mothers like my friend, Jamie Beck, I, I will sometimes post her daughter and be like, I don't wanna hear any comments about anything. If you have anything to yeah. say about <laughs> my parenting, just like, don't say it, how's that? Um, yeah. It seems like it's, it's pretty pervasive in social people just also like, nitpicking your mothering style and stuff which seems yeah you know, it crazy, really but... it's it, it, it's it's awful um and it yeah. and it especially as a new mom like it really took a toll and I was just like this isn't this isn't worth it like I mm -hmm. I just want a mother and do that and not have all this commentary from thousands of people who really have no right to say how I parent um, mm -hmm. But that is also the nature of social media and parenting in this day you know there's just right. like a million opinions from everywhere so um it, that's why it's just yeah. so important to 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 create boundaries and and do what is going to save your your sanity yeah emma yes um i wanted to add that i think it's really important to ask yourself what your purpose is in sharing whatever that might be so if it's you know kids or anything outside of what you're actually normally posting what's your objective? What are you trying to get out of it? Um, I think will help to connect you to, is this something that I should be posting? And if so, that also can help you conceptualize any negative comments you might be getting because you're very clear on, this is why I'm posting this thing and anything else I can sort of, you know, dismiss because that's, that's not part of what I'm doing here. Yeah. I feel like we could talk for certainly at least another 30 minutes. Um, one last question, just rapid fire for everybody. There's a question here that I think is interesting. Someone says, you know, if money weren't a driver, would you still be on social or would you keep your content to yourself? So we'll start with Emma just, and, and would love to hear y'all's answers as a closing, as we close here. I would, I also, I don't get paid to be on social media and I'm on it because I want to be and I would do it anyway. So yeah, for me, yeah. Danya? I think James knows the answer to this, but 100% yes. I absolutely love documenting everything. So, um, yes. Uh, Alyssa, I know this, you're not as, as, as much on social, but. <laughs> yeah, we um, are, my well-being social is something that we live and breathe that we don't earn from, at least not yet. And we really prioritize that as far as um, sharing a little bit of light and a little bit of tools and resources from a mental health perspective, because there is so much in the news and in the feed that is so scary. So short answer, yes. Longer answer as an individual, I um, have flirted with, you know, do I lean more into influencing or not? And so far I've said no, just by nature of how much is on my plate and how much I know about what you all go through. And I want it to be an intentional decision. So a little bit of both. I'm a little, in terms yeah. of balance, a yes and no. <laughs> what about you, Jess? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm obviously, as I told you, I'm leaving Instagram personally and I'm going to have someone run my account. So, I mean, I think um, I love the, the connection with my community, but I think I can have that elsewhere. So, yeah. 
Well, thank you all um, so much. Uh, this was super inspiring and educational for me. You know, I think in closing, um, you know, I hope there's more conversations around this. I think that this is a big problem. I think we need to be more respectful of influencers' mental health and we need to talk about it more. I also want to close by also saying that, you know, there's a lot of great things about social. It changed my life. Um, I know it's changed a lot of people's lives. It allows us to do incredible things. And I, you know, we talk about this stuff not to, you know, I think bash it, but to get to a place where it's a healthier relationship and where creators can have decades long careers and do this without, you know, feeling like they have to quit or feeling like it's too much. Because right now I think the pace and the expectations for creators are not sustainable. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more people um, starting to break. And I think social can be a really beautiful, incredible thing. And we want more people to be able to do it for as long as they uh, want to. So we will be sharing this video and the deck. Thank you all so much. You know where to find, uh, I, I think, our amazing panelists. If there's any questions that we didn't get to, and there were a lot of those, I apologize. I can also answer some of them in uh, Negronis with Nord, which is on our YouTube uh, every week. So we can talk about some of that. Um, but thank you all so much uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Great to see you.